Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Wadera. This is Alex Smith. And we are live at the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, AHPM, the Hospice Palliative Care, Hospice and Palliative Nursing Association, HPNA, and Swippin meeting in Boston. And we have a guest with us today. Who is our special guest today, Alex? Today our guest is Dr. K. Oichi, who is an emergency medicine physician and internist and research fellow at the Brigham and Women's Hospital right here in Boston. He was up working until 3 a.m. last night, but he is kind enough to come join us today on the Jerry Pell Podcast. Welcome to the Jerry Pell Podcast, Kay. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor. So I just want to say I was up till 2.30 last night, but I was not working. <laughs> um, we always start off with a song request. Do you have a song request for Alex? How about Just Breathe? Perfect. Good choice, given the material. Stay with me. Let's just breathe. So that was a very apropos for the discussion we're going to be talking about today, which is intubation in um, uh, older adults in the emergency room. So you just published a paper in the Journal of American Geriatric Society, or JAGS, titled Prognosis After Emergency Department Intubation to Inform Shared Decision Making. And it's like an all-star cast of authors that you have on this article, including uh, James Tulski and Rebecca Sidori and Mara Schoenberg. Really uh, amazing. But before we go to the article, what got you interested in this subject? I've been a practicing emergency physician and internist for a few years. And through my training and my current clinical practice, I always wondered, what is the information that clinicians have to communicate to the patients or surrogates about this critical juncture of their life and their illness. And I just didn't know how to do it. So I started to look through what's the available information that's out there about this. And I realized that we don't really know, actually, um, what really happens to all comers in the emergency department. And the data was lacking. And um, I wanted to learn more about that. And that's how this got started. So it looks like what you did is you you took adults aged 65 years and older who were intubated in the emergency room from 2008 to 2015 amongst all these different hospitals, 262 hospitals. What did you find? So I think the most important finding that we found is that we confirmed that in-hospital mortality after emergency department intubation for older adults, regardless of their comorbidities or the admitting diagnosis is very high, which I think most clinicians knew already, but we put it in numbers. And we tried to come up with ways to better communicate that to the patients or surrogates by the clinicians. So we'll have a picture of this amazing figure too that you included in this JAGS article of older adults um, and their outcomes both survival and returning home, surviving and discharging to a nursing home versus dying in the hospital, which is broken uh, down to 65 to 74 year olds, all the way to greater than 90 year olds. And it's a really impressive graph. Um, By the way, was it 33% um, of all comers, older adults died? Um, Wait, what was the the statistic, do you remember? Yes, that's correct. It's uh, 33% when you take all comers coming into the emergency department who are all intubated in the emergency department. 33% died before discharge, so did not survive the hospitalization. Yes, that's correct. And among people who are older than 90, that number is much higher. It's 50%. Yeah, and in that group, it's even more impressive looking at this graph. It's uh, 50% died of the greater than 90 year olds, 36% survived but were discharged to a nursing home and only 14% survived and returned home after that index hospitalization. Now we have no data what happens right after the hospital, right? Is there any way to get that? I have really thought a lot about this because the most interesting information is actually what happens to the patients after they leave the hospital, right? So what is that quality of life like and things like that, which is really, it's certainly not in this data set. 
I think it has to be merged with Medicare data set and some other data set to come up with that, which is going to be hard. Yeah, because when I, when I think about like having these discussions with people in the emergency room, you know, going to a skilled nursing facility is generally not like the, the big decision point. It's not ever being able to return back home. So it would be really valuable to know of these individuals who went to the skilled nursing facility, how many were actually able to return home? I'm guessing it's incredibly small. I really want to learn more about that, but unfortunately I haven't had an opportunity to work with the data set that has all that information yet. Um, I think as clinicians, we all know anecdotally what happens to some of these patients that we've taken care of, but as a, as a whole, um, big picture, it's still slightly unclear. Now, other than age, were there other factors that helped you identify patients who were at greater risk of dying before leaving the hospital? Yes. So there, there are, but the answer is, um, so for example, uh, metastatic cancer, having the comorbid diagnosis of metastatic cancer or admitting diagnosis of stroke or um, intracranial hemorrhage. And remember, these are people who are all intubated in emergency department. So intracranial hemorrhage with intubation in emergency department. Those are, um, yes, they would increase your chance of not making it in the hospital for sure. What was striking to me was that none of, the, none of these things all combined, they still don't predict the in-hospital mortality with this good discrimination. It wasn't all that surprising to me for me to find that because we know you know, all the patients are all very different and it's very difficult to risk stratify them. That's why you need a clinician to kind of take into all the information together to decide that. And I think at least in this claims data set, there's really not enough information to account for that kind of accuracy. And we really need more information about patients' functional status and things like that. Yeah. So you also cite uh, a recent JAMA IM article talking about um, uh, rates of intubation um, for older adults and how dementia, I think, was outpacing all of their diagnoses by a factor of four as far as the, the increasing rates of intubation. Um, do you have any data around cognitive status in these individuals? And did, was that a factor? Yes, I agree. And... Um I think that's probably a very important factor. Unfortunately, in this administrative data set, there is no um, variable that accounts for cognitive status. Even the diagnosis of dementia is not well documented. I mean, they, they are, but it's hard to figure out how accurate that is compared to things like diabetes or heart failure. So um, yes, that would have been a lovely information to learn more about, but we just don't have that information in this data set. So here's a question. Do you have uh, do you have information or or if not what do you think would happen to similarly sick patients who are not intubated who are in the emergency department but not intubated Are there similarly sick patients like it's intubation like these people are like that's a marker of sickness Well I I guess my point is if 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 they weren't intubated then mortality probably would have been 100% right No okay okay so we know from, so prior studies on this type of issue is that they usually take um, one disease group or one um, phenomenon like sepsis or something like that, and then follow sort of their outcomes. And we know that patients who go to ICU, if they get intubated, their rate of uh, in-hospital hospital, in hospital mortality jumps dramatically, as you can imagine. So we know that intubation itself are certainly associated with in-hospital mortality, and people who are not intubated are uh, less likely to die in a hospital, but that's just the nature of their illness itself. And one more comment about um, people who are not intubated, but they should have been intubated, but they were not for one reason or another. It could be, you know, that they had terminal illness or, you know, they had some kind of conversation that led to that. There's really no good information about that other than a case, case series studies. And... Um, it's actually not true. Not everyone dies in these case three studies. Some people survive, you know, like these people who come in with DNR, DNI orders, and they are not intubated, but they are go to ICU or hospital, they survive. And we don't really know exactly how much, because these are all very small numbers. Right. So it's interesting, because it, it helps put this in context. You know, if 
a different decision were made, what might happen? Because when, I, I guess I'm getting to the implications of this and how you see this being used in clinical practice. Like, for example, do you see emergency providers taking these figures to surrogates of seriously ill patients in the emergency department and saying, you know, intubation is one option here. I, I just, I'd like you to have accurate information about what might happen based on national study of people who like your loved one who were sick and were intubated in the emergency department. That tells one piece of the story. The other piece of the story is what happens if we don't intubate them? So m maybe a little bit from you about how you see this being used clinically or is it ready for use clinically? I think all my uh, mentors would say that this is not ready to be used immediately clinically because this is the first iteration of this type of decision aid. And, and, and that's correct. You know, this has to be tested on different clinicians and different patients to see if how they understand this for sure. But one comment that I'd like to make is that um, we hope that this information is helpful when a clinician is synthesizing all the information that you see in front of you. Um, their vital signs, their lab values, their clinical status, and com having this conversation with the patient or surrogate we hope that this information is somewhere back in their mind to share with them about the baseline risk of mortality for older adults. But it certainly does not speak anything about patients who decide not to get intubated, what happens to them, because we were unable to look at that information. So do you have any examples from your clinical practice that you could um, share with our audience in a way that's anonymized enough to protect the confidentiality of the people you've cared for, um, where this sort of issues come up and you wish there had been more information available to make a decision about this. Can I just clarify one thing before I talk more about that? So uh, what I want to clarify is that this type of decision aid to communicate uh, the probability and likelihood of some event happening is only used for, for uh, goals of care conversations that happen in a subacute setting, I think. And what I mean by that is um, people who are really about to get intubated and they're hypoxic and hypotensive, and when their family arrives and they are crying and yelling at you, like, why can't you put the my dad on breathing machine right now. That's certainly not the time to bring this decision aid and say, hey, look at this, you know, like, don't you understand this probability? So that's not what this is meant for. Our hope was that this was meant for people who are more subacute and have time and um, emotional status that's uh, control to think about cognitive issues like this, like the probabilities. I think um, there are two types of conversations in emergency departments like this. One is hyperacute like what I just described. People who are, have their emotions super high and they are unable to process this type of numbers unless their emotions sort of handled in a way that they can. And there are majority of my patients are people who are very ill and they're gonna get admitted to the hospital but they're not at that point yet and they can still either converse with you or their surrogates can kind of make this decision, near-term decision going forward and our hope is that this is used for those patients where I'm worried that your dad is getting sicker and he might have a chance of having to have to go on a breathing machine during your hospitalization somehow today you know have you ever thought about this and, it, and if they're in the right state in terms of their emotional status then perhaps these numbers could be helpful for these patients to understand but the, the numbers we're looking at here people who get intubated in the emergency room do we have data on what happens to those people once they get admitted from the emergency room? Are the numbers worse or better as far as survival or discharge to skilled nursing facilities for older adults? So that, that's correct. So uh, there are uh, prior studies on patients when they look at patients who are intubated in a hospital rather than the emergency department. And the numbers are fairly similar, but they don't... Uh, they don't usually, they didn't really describe how many people would go to the nursing home or how many people would go home after the hospitalization. But in terms of in-hospital mortality, it's fairly similar. And that's one of the important findings that this paper brought up because those 
uh, prior large studies excluded people who are who died in emergency department. But actually, those are actually rare, and the numbers are very similar to people who are intubated after hospitalization. Is, is there a specific clinical case that comes to mind when you think about this issue? So, I had one patient, maybe a month ago, who. Um, let's say his name is Mr. C, who was 85 and had metastatic lung cancer with pleural effusions who are coming in with uh, hypoxia and hypotension. And the um, patient was actually on home hospice service, and uh, the daughter called 911 because um, he didn't look very well. And of course, he arrived in the emergency department. Of course, the patient has no uh, ability to speak for himself at all because he's huffing and puffing and he's on BiPAP and he can't really make these decisions. But now this decision is made with the surrogate, who's the daughter who arrives with the patient. And she is crying and kind of yelling, like, why can't you put, this, put my dad on a breathing machine? So this is, this is actually a common, it's not common, but it happens frequently in emergency department. And, and then um, when I think about back to this paper, that's really not the time for you to bring up this decision aid. The, the actually, the, um, these items can be used, but in a different settings. So for example, um, I was watching my trainee uh, go through this conversation like next to him. And when she says, why can't you intubate or, or put my dad on a breathing machine, he starts to talk about, well, the probability of, uh, you know, surviving this hospitalization if he were to go on the breathing machine is, I don't know what it is, which I know, but I don't know what it is, but um, it's blah, 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 blah. And he starts to explain about the numbers of why this is important. So that's a perfect example of when this decision is should not be used. Because I think in my mind, what that daughter was asking is, can you please help my dad, you know? So, um, so this, is the, this is an important point, that the numbers are very important for clinicians to know, but they're not, um, you have to choose the right moment to use this type of decision aid. So, so let's, let's talk for a second, like when you are in that situation with a resident and, and maybe they're starting to talk about numbers, uh, and you're feeling it, this is not the right place. Because it sounds like you, you're thinking maybe this happens even before the emergency room, but this is still important in the emergency room, at least it sounds like as well. So obviously we want this to occur as early as possible. But when you're in that situation with a resident, they're talking about numbers. What do you do in that instance? I, I s- struggle with that too. And I asked like people who are a lot senior than me, like what, what do you think I should be doing too? And I try variations of it to see which one might work. But the last example I had is I had to stop them. And I, I just said, hey, um, I want to add something. Would it be all right if I interject right now? And the trainees won't keep going because I'm the attending. And, and then I kind of start to take over the conversation. So it's a really hard balance of um, allowing the trainees to do as much as they want as well as keeping the, the patient safe um, as the, the, the lead clinician is it, always a hard balance, especially in this like, hyper-acute setting. And then, then do you reverse the conversation to go back to big picture goals, values, and how like you're not actually talking about the numbers, but you're talking mainly making, ma- making recommendations based on those numbers? Is that right? That's correct. So... Um, what, I, what I usually do is that um, I say things like, this it sounds like a very important topic, and that number is also important. And I also hear you, the patient's daughter, that you, are, you really want to learn more about this. Now, I don't want to ignore that, but I want to put that on hold, and I want to learn a little bit more about your dad before I can talk more about what I would recommend in this situation. Well, I really want to thank you for joining us today and having a great discussion. It was a really phenomenal JAGS article, and I love the color picture, which we will have on our Jerry Pal website. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So, Alex, um, do you want to, since we're talking about intubation, do you want to give us a little bit more Just Breathe by Eddie Vedder? Yes. I understand.
understand that every life must end uh -huh. As we sit alone, I know someday we must go uh -huh. Oh, I'm a lucky man to count on both hands the ones I love Some folks they have one Yeah, others they've got none uh -huh. Stay with me Let's just breathe I want to thank all our listeners for joining us this week, uh, especially uh, live from the AHPM, HPNA, and Swipman meeting uh, in Boston. And we will talk with you next week. Thanks, folks.